<laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Latter Daily Digest and. Welcome to Mormon Civil War. That's right. It's a great collaboration. Are, our channels are teaming up to have crazy conference predictions. And the reason why we're going to do this is we're going to say, what would a really good Mormon church look like and what changes would have to be made? And maybe they're going to announce these changes at conference someday. Absolutely. Soon. What would it look like? <laughs> they're going to have to if they want to survive. <laughs> so so we figured thing, it all out, Gene. Let's let's start from the very, very top. Maybe I'll make a first suggestion, a first prediction that they're going to announce yep. the quorum of the 15 is going to have um, age limitations and they'll they will retire. Oh, the quorum of the 15 at some age. I don't know. What's a good age? 75, 80. They usually are still healthy. I think. I think 75. Because. Um, and we don't also, have to get too so specific what's the about problem? it. No, I mean, well, you might because it's so hard for them because they've 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 got so lucky and probably feel chosen by destiny to make it up all those ranks and ranks and ranks of priesthood to be chosen from the 70 usually or wherever they come from and then to be able to actually get within touching distance of being the prophet um we might have you to know call, you don't give that up easily <laughs> we might have to call that position something like a member of the golden high council you know we attach some huh? superlative yeah. to it so that it sounds like yes. they've made it and an honorary status yeah, yeah because i think well the situation we have now is inevitably as soon as brigham young introduced longevity of service as the criteria for being an apostle and then having a chance of being the prophet and president of the church it was inevitable that within a few decades or whatever you would start having most of your prophets are dying old men so at the end they're exhausted they're tired they're very much out of touch with the needs of the modern world and and the whole point of having living prophets is meant to be to have them speak to that um and i think for me the the clincher in in disab disabusing myself of the idea that oh but you want the people with the most longevity and experience in leadership which is the church's big excuse was a br really good article in the enzyme a few years ago which pointed out that this church was founded and became a global phenomenon by young single adults or young adults people young, in their 20s and men. early 30s and women we'll and say. they they cranked out scripture like confetti they they coped with all kinds of crises and moved forward. They I held remember, on to a kind of a vision. Yeah, I remember when I was twenty one. I knew everything. I knew it all. There was no no Absolutely. doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and so and somehow they, they end up being more more fun than eighty year olds who are sure they know everything. Uh, in my yeah, experience. so what would be a good next? So yeah. Thing? Okay, so we're, we're going for emeritus status for apostles like they do for the 70s. Otherwise, we waste so much time. We're just, we're getting, you know, if, if they all descend into dementia, nearly all of them, um, for years even. I, I was sent on a mission um, with a, a mission call signed by a machine pretending to be a prophet who I went to testify was leading the church in the modern age. And he was in a coma, it turned out later. We're, you know, President Benson, that was, you know, that's just wrong. That's shameful. So I love that idea. Um, I think priesthood, uh, we have to ordain women, simple as, you know, the, the recent revolution in response to um, Annette's, oh, what's her surname? Um, whoever she was of the Relief Society General Presidency. Dennis. Saying, Mr. Dennis, Dennis, that's it. Um, always throws me when someone's second name is the first name. Um, where she said that, you know, women in the church are, you know, more women get more empowered than in any other church, which was clearly ludicrous because they don't have anything, any kind of equality with men in anything. And as various people pointed out, there's no decision um, a woman can make in the church that can't be overruled by a man in, in their church roles. Um, 
And, and it's kind of they, disingenuous you know, they, for people to say that, well, even yeah. men can have their decision overruled by men that are higher up. So it's almost equal except for the very top. Yeah, yeah. She isn't real. Um, I think in a sense she had a point that we do involve everyone in ministry. I think that is a real plus of, of our church, you know, and I've I spent quite a lot of time uh, being around and worshipping with Christians and other denominations and i i love that because i what i see there is you you your whole congregation is very much tied to the opinions and worldview and personal style of an individual vicar or minister or priest um and i've seen churches in my community just disband or lose their congregation overnight because that person moved to a different place or died and people didn't like the new person and it was far too much influence and power for one human to have, um, which is a lesson for us with our prophet. Um, and also, um, I think it kind of drives you a bit mad. You you have expertise. So you might have people in, in the way most Christian churches organize themselves. You'll have a worship leader and that's their job, the music and the singing and leading that. You will have someone who's in youth ministry and they do lots of training and get really expert at that. But that's what they're doing for decades. And I think they just get stale and burn out. Can you imagine? I mean, I've, I've, I know it's a bit different in the international church where we're so short of people. I've had probably about twenty-five different callings. Um, you know, I've had to go at almost everything. Uh, you'd just get bored out of your mind if you're going to be young men's president for ten years or more, or the rest of your life, or just the music leader. Uh, so I do right. love that we involve everyone who's active in ministering, in teaching, in leadership roles, in youth. I think that's brilliant, and and that women are involved in that hands-on ministry. And think about the work that in can be done. Way, the work that can yeah. be done by doubling the number of priesthood holders over. Well, absolutely. You know, a short period of time. Yeah. And this Especially would be this would be church. this would be a very good conference to announce that because our uh, mm. brothers in the gospel, the community of Christ, announced that their next president will be a woman mm -hmm. and so this would be the perfect yeah. conference for that to be announced <laughs> yeah and, and and i think it was was it 40 years ago they gave women the priesthood um so they've, they've been at it for 40 the years middle now. 80s right 85 or so mm -hmm. somewhere around there yeah, yeah. and um yeah, yeah so i mean milestone marker one of the, yeah one of the um, Community of Christ Emeritus Apostles is British and I'm on a mailing list and I get a weekly update of what sort of they're offering online here in Britain. Um, and they, they had a 40th sort of anniversary celebration recently. Yeah, so I think definitely, you know, the 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 feminism is back. You know, the, it's just unsustainable where, as people keep saying, if the LDS Church is the only institution in people's lives of any age group we usually think about the young people certainly but our age any age where women are not equal they don't have any access to decision making leadership roles um they are patronized heavily they're still in the family proclamation this idea that a woman's place is primarily in the home as a wife and a mother this is also outdated um, and it's just not sustainable. And it's remarkable how many people um, leaving the church now are saying the trigger for them was simply having a daughter. That they had a daughter or their daughter's coming up to youth and they just resolve, especially their mothers, I cannot have my daughter go through what was done to me. The messaging about my second class status, my subservience, my, um, you know, that I don't, shouldn't have a place as an equal in in the whole of politics the world social business all of that that ultimately my only value is if i can crank out children and look beautiful that's right um, and, and and all you need to do put their is you could use the the same announcement where um when the restriction on blacks in the priesthood was used except you just take yeah. out male you say all worthy members yeah. of the church yeah. could um yeah could could participate in it and kind of a corollary to that would be allowing yeah. lgbtq access to temple blessings of eternal marriage yeah yeah 
I think that's the other one, isn't it? This is this is the big issue of our day, and I'm I'm kind of intrigued because I've. I'm very conscious. I've been having a few conversations um, for the first time in a while with other Christians um, and sort of their worldview. One one of them particularly who's quite fundamentalist, young earth creationist Baptist. And, um, and you sort of, it seems crazy, but Mormonism is almost ahead of the curve a bit compared to a lot of Christian denominations in agonizing over this. Um, most churches have to some extent, um, the Pope is is blowing people's minds by offering, you know, I think the idea of blessing same-sex relationships, um, but certainly liberalising significantly on this matter. The Church of England uh, 20 years ago just went through, tied itself up in knots and just about averted schisms to ordain women. But they are now grappling with a potential schism over LGBTQ ordination. Um they will allow non-practicing LGBTQ people to be clergy, but if they're in a, an active sexual relationship, that's a no-no. And and the fact that we've kind of, I know it's in the post-Mormon space, but the fact that the debate around this is so intense and strong in Mormonism almost feels like we're catching up for once on a major social issue and our conversations to quite, to some extent are matching or going a bit beyond those in some other fundamentalist christian denominations so i think that's quite exciting because because we've got so much precedent for having made epic changes of things that never seemed they'd change like polygamy or not ordaining black people so i think yeah i th we this is something we can do and and certainly it's again one of the top reasons people are leaving or not staying or not joining is they're simply not going to join a homophobic and transphobic religion particularly if they're coming from a secular starting point which in britain is you know hardly anyone's religious anymore it's it's you know they're rare as hen's teeth you are mostly trying to convince secular people to to become religious and they're going to look at that and think god of love are you kidding me what's going on you know and it sure. is a big change it has me you know for all of us we've had to really change if we're if we've become LGBTQ allies, often it is step by step, tiny incremental baby steps to reframe things, to not be horrified by something that used to seem so depraved and awful, um, to spend time meeting and talking to our LGBTQ friends and, and seeing their lives from their perspective. It takes some time to, okay, to got, change, but my... it's happening. Love is love. Hey! Haha, <laughs> brilliant. That's my little support right now. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, yeah. They they are human beings. They're fellow human beings. They're wonderful people yeah. in almost all cases. And you know, same same rate mm -hmm. of wonderfulness, you know, throughout the whole spectrum. Yeah. And um, mm. you know, they have you know, I I had an uncle who was gay, and when I was young, I was maybe 20 and and I was just felt sorry that he could not officially be connected to his his companion, his you know partner, whatever, his boyfriend, whatever they called it at the time, you know. And I remember our family loved him, but they also mm. sort of othered him at the same time. They, they would yeah. make some jokes yeah. in front of him and and then behind his back, and it was it was just kind of a sad situation. It's so much nicer maybe even so much more christ-like to love you know your fellow human beings in that way and to be accepting and so i mean so what jesus a, was very clear that the, the definition of christianity is not the easy wins it is that you go and walk with the people that society rejects the most that considers the most lost um, and that, that's a test of Christianity that we're failing in many ways. However, I think there's a lot of goodwill. My stake, my ward members have been amazingly and at times surprisingly supportive of our LGBTQ members. I think there's very few families now that don't have an out LGBTQ person in them. Um, it changes everything. It and really I think makes almost look at things differently. The, the essence of the Mormon Civil War is that there seems to be Pharisees at the top and Christians at yeah. the bottom. 
you know, the, the yeah. loving people are in the wards, right? Mm -hmm. At a higher rate. But we'll there is a, yeah, absolutely. Um, but there is a dynamic that also threatens that, which is why I think our window of opportunity for these reforms is getting narrower each year as well. Uh, even while it seems inevitable that these things have to happen, that most of the the more liberal minded people, the more tolerant people uh, are being driven out and have been for decades. There's been a relentless drive to only retain and approve of the people who are least likely to think um, that way, that we're keeping our Pharisees with, as um, Richard Bushman, the historian said, you know, we're pandering to the grandmothers of San Pete County at the cost of keeping their grandchildren in the church, which is a disaster because then they die and then you have no church. That's um, right. And that's Spen absolutely the dynamic that's been going on in my area. Yeah. Spencer Kimball had a very narrow window of opportunity. He brought up the subject mm. of allowing blacks to have the priesthood mm. when coincidentally mm. three of the top um, opposers of yeah. that policy happened yeah. to be out of the state on assignment yeah so that was yeah, definitely what well, well, just... yeah one was in hospital one was in ecuador <laughs> oh, one was in hospital <laughs> so they right. did it without him yeah, yeah. and so um, what do you have next okay so i love that um i think stuff to do with common consent we have to bring back democracy i think we wouldn't have made most of the terrible mistakes that have alienated huge swathes of our population um, we wouldn't have had the church embarrassing itself to have to keep backtracking. I don't think the November policy would have fl flown, which then had to be reversed three and a half years later. I don't think we'd have had um, the infamous oral sex gate with um, Spencer Kimball, which only lasted nine months, of it, including questions about forbidding oral sex in the Temple Recommend interview. Um we wouldn't have the racism would not have lasted anything like as long if or even come in in the first place potentially if the collective wisdom of the whole membership had been powerfully consulted in decision making and this is tricky because we used to a very authoritarian top-down sort of system because that's what we've got used to but it's been amazing to learn that in the first era of the church they used to have heated debates in conference and then vote and um, the example buried deep, but there now in the, the church history supportive resources for studying church history and doctrine and governance uh, put out by the church is the conference recorded in Times and Seasons where um, Joseph Smith wanted to get rid of Sidney Rigdon from the first presidency. Sidney and his supporters kind of argued back. They had a heated debate. They had a vote and the membership voted to keep him in the first presidency. And Joseph Smith accepted that. Which That's right. And the whole people's minds today. The whole think that was possible. succession crisis after Joseph Smith was murdered. Yeah. Um, there was debate. Yeah. And somehow Brigham Young won by saying, I'll be a caretaker until the next prophet mm -hmm. um, evacuated yeah. the, the saints to Iowa and then mm -hmm. sort of had mm -hmm. the quorum of the 12 take over leadership by s slowly yeah. um, by getting stealth. <laughs> people on that side and breaking away from the, the other, the losers of the, um, mm -hmm. the debates. Right. You had you had Sidney mm -hmm. Reagan saying, I have claim to it. You had James Strang. Mm -hmm. You had um, mm -hmm. who was the first historian? I don't know. Did he, was he in the church at the time? Um, Whitmer. No, he probably wasn't. But uh, mm -hmm. some Whitmer. some other people. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So along with um, common consent. Yeah. Would I, so would common go... consent decision making. Uh, so, it's, yes. We, well, what we, wrote, we need to see. I predict crowdsourcing. at this crowdsourced. conference, yes, crowdsourced decision. There will be, yeah. Um, but the point is, this is already in our scriptures, which I think is amazing. the The polar great price makes very clear that God runs His heaven by consent. There was a heated the war in heaven wasn't people firing lasers at each other. It was a debate about ideas. And the people voted. A third voted badly, and and her <laughs> got kicked out. Uh, and, and it adoption, wasn't God saying, thirds. okay, every spirit, you have to use your moral agency to agree with me and Jesus. No, that's all. That wasn't that didn't it exist. Was, although that's how they spent the that's how, no, that's how that that's how they're trying to teach it now, though, which is outrageous. 
Um, no, it was it was open debate, and God trusted the majority in a in a situation of informed consent and debate to make wise decisions. That's the whole point. We are gods in embryo. We're not stupid. Um, we have that potential to get things right. The Book of Mormon teaches that democracy is God's far preferred system of secular government. That he, you know, it teaches that it's better to have democracy even than a righteous king. You know, and they had prophet kings, but the risks are too high that the one person can tip the whole nation one way or another. And that's one of the lessons from the Old Testament that we learn. Probably by um, a righteous that, prophet drinking a cup of coffee. That would probably yeah, make an unrighteous, just like that. It's all it would take. <laughs> and speaking of so, um, cup of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. We could bring back. So, no, sorry, just to finish. Oh, yeah. Finish that. Yeah. I just, just finished my point that, yeah, that the Doctrine and Covenants in sec in Section 26 and other places that talk about doing all things by common consent and Section 107, which divides power between equally between First Presidency, Apostle, Quorum of Twelve Apostles, First Quorum of Seventy and Stake High Councils or High Priest Count Quorums, um, they're, they're all equal. They can discipline each other. The prophet can be excommunicated by any bishop or disciplined by any bishop convening a council of 12 high priests. And it says specifically because the prophet is no different to anyone else. They're That's not royalty. Right. They're not a king. They're just one of us. Um, and so democracy is... And people keep saying to me, but it's not democracy. What are you saying? Well, it is because in, in functioning democracies... Political parties have a vision, a manifesto, a purpose. Their leaders propose people for you to vote for. So it's not like the people deciding who the candidates are. The the establishment, the leadership establishment in that government system proposes candidates. But then we check them out and decide if we're supporting or voting for them. If not, if we vote oppose, then they have to choose, uh, propose someone else. And that they is argue, exactly the same they as government work about what yeah. um, the direction they should go on certain issues. They talk about mm. important issues and they they make decisions. Mm. And in America, they call it a platform where a party yeah. will support these 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 positions on these issues. And so, mm. yeah, that's all part of it. And so, so, so democracy democracy is in our scriptures. It's how God runs heaven. It's how governments should run, and it's how the church is meant to be run, that you consult the people about all major decisions. And for most of our lives, the Institute Manual had, had this paragraph until very recently, which said that all the, the common consent doesn't just apply to people's callings. It should apply to doctrine, what is canonized as scripture, policies, and anything else that impacts the lives of the saints. Obviously, My we haven't been doing it. But it was there in the Institute Manual. Someone thought it was the right thing, as it should be, because that's what it means to do everything by common consent. That's right. My understanding that they had um, in the early days of the church a uh, scripture committee. They would try to see which of Joseph Smith's revelations were good enough, let's say, yeah. to be in the canon. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe and yeah. they and and we know that they have taken away scriptures from the canon. They took away the lectures mm -hmm. on faith. They took away some other yeah. things that were just right in mm -hmm. the accepted canon. And mm -hmm. so we should bring that back as well, right? You talk about common consent. It, it boils yeah. over into what should be scripture now, right? And so and, and along Great with that question. Yeah. A section, I mean section 89 in the Doctrine and Covenants is the word of wisdom. Now, yeah. <laughs> early on for I don't know 50, 70 years, I don't know how long, it was it was just a suggestion. It was just a good health code. And then at some point they changed it to you have to obey it as if God any of God's suggestions are really God's laws. That's how I remember hearing mm -hmm. it. And we need to mm -hmm. take it back maybe to the way it was and, and let people yeah. be learn things and govern themselves. Or absolutely, or at least do it properly, like it says on the tin, which, which is, you know, I'm I'm quite happy with, with banning tea and coffee. I'm surrounded by freaking caffeine addicts. It's not healthy. It's really bad for them. 
they leave their drug paraphernalia all over my desks when I'm teaching at school. There's like cold, half-drunk coffee everywhere. It's like finding the foil wrappers of the heroin addicts and the needles in the children's <laughs> playgrounds. So I've no time at all for these tea and coffee addicts. Um, and they all have, you know, they're like, oh, I must get my coffee or I can't be human. That's slavery. Free yourselves. So it's much absolutely, better if I, that I totally music. agree. If those things were urged by uh, what's it called when when you in order to preserve your pe priesthood you have to encourage people with kindness and gentleness yeah. and not by gentle persuasion gentle persuasion <laughs> right so that exists right that not that's part of the teachings dominions. yeah right yeah and so if but it's, also if not going to do things yeah, that but way it, it, take it out. <laughs> I love the word of wisdom. I think it, it's true because it starts with because of conspiring men in the last days i mean huge there are entire countries in this world now in ruin because of drugs because of the drug cartels the cocaine in colombia the um the heroin in afghanistan and elsewhere um absolutely disastrous historically britain committed an atrocity against humanity by stoking up the opium wars by in insisting on selling heroin to China, basically in return for tea trade, um, and and the generations of harm that did to people there. So I think the principle is is truly a modern revelation for what's what we now know is essential to our health. But and let's let it conform with science. Part, yes, which it mostly does. You know, mm -hmm. seriously, a lot of it does. But the thing is, it's also about positive, healthy eating. You're not meant to be overdoing the meat. You know, meat should be scarce, not total vegetarian. If, um, but, you know, not overdoing the meat. Um, healthy, you know, eating fresh fruit and veg, that sort of thing. That's basic health advice. And just as much as it was a warning to not become drug addicted and to collapse your whole society's social life and collective health, through those addictions, through smoking, through tea and coffee, through um, other addictive drugs, but also the the obesity crisis, the diabetes crisis. You know that the majority of Americans now are overweight and dying of diabetes and heart disease and avoidable things, and it's starting to happen here as well. And think I'm, about I'm it, I'm a chocolate addict. You know, it's two, bad. I'm, I'm two hundred years ago. Are huge. Yeah, there didn't need to be any yeah. advice on exercise because almost everybody had to labor no. for their for their living, yeah. their livelihood for just, you know, walking yeah. through the town, you know, all, all kinds of things. And now maybe mm. part of the word of wisdom could be suggestions on exercise regimen. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a principle and it's about that principle. But you are not hearing anyone from the pulpit teaching this because they'll be accused of fat shaming or whatever the other sensitivities around that are. But mainly, it's just complete hypocrisy that, that you know, the, the diet of American Mormons is appalling. Um, and, I'm you know, I'm, as I said, I'm not one to judge that much. And you um, know what I've noticed? But also, I've noticed some of the um, quorum of mm. the 15 who maybe entered the quorum as maybe a little bit overweight, they have slimmed down. So... Yeah they are abiding yeah. by some sort of dietary rules that that maybe mm. could be shared you know they're living to 100 years yeah. old apparently you know nelson's going to have his 100th birthday at the end of the summer yeah and so shall i know. tell you what those dietary rules are they have two parts one your church is paying a fortune for your private health insurance there's one number two is you might be profit if you don't die. That's a huge motivator to stay alive, isn't it? And to sort your health out. That if you don't drop dead, you could be God's mouthpiece on earth. You get to have I all mean, your pet projects the be the course that the church takes. I that that would get me on there. I've got an exercise bike. We've got one. I don't know if you can see it behind me. There's the handles. So it's quite good mm -hmm. for hanging clothes on. Um, we occasionally we even use it. We're we're determined this year to get our act together. But the the other thing about word of wisdom and where it's blown out proportion, where you've talked about it should be voluntary, not compulsory, because it's so easily measurable. As soon as Mormons in casual conversation or in a talk start talking about righteousness, they will immediately go number one and two tithing. 
word of wisdom as if they're the two most important things when jesus priorities were compassion love forgiveness patience working with the sinners all of those things he doesn't give a flying poo about how much tea you're drinking compared to that stuff but our culture by having it on the list and it's easily measurable has turned that into the be all and end all of defining ourselves and our who we are as a religion and all my life i've listened to people giving their testimonies of how isn't the word of wisdom great because when i have to keep saying no to a cup of tea or or going to the pub for a drink with my friends i can stand for righteousness and they know i'm different and it's the start of a gospel conversation not hello peter why are you fa why are you so kind why are you nice why do right. you work so hard you know it's which really should be the defining characteristics of our difference it's That's right. oh why don't you smoke you're weird and uh, all of that becomes a distortion of what the religion and, and you talk about, about working too hard Pharisee. there yeah. are some callings in our wards where people actually do a lot of work and maybe they should be compensated for that maybe bishops and Relief Society presidents should get some sort of stipend for all their efforts. We have, you know, doctors and ambulance drivers and, uh, you know, police officers that are doing good work, but they're also getting compensated. Why not, you know, if we're compensating the top yeah. leaders, we have enough money, let's compensate the people at the front line. I think that's completely reasonable because we are paying our... It turns out our apostles, our 70s and our mission presidents all get the same salary of around 160 grand dollars, thousand dollars a year, plus huge amounts of expenses, which puts them in the top one to two percent, really, at least top five percent of incomes in Britain and America, two of the richest nations on Earth. And, and most and of that completely is completely outrageous. Most of that is on top of whatever their profession was in life that they're receiving retirement yes. Yes. or social security yeah. yes. or, or anything yeah. like that. And yeah. or the, the savings accounts they, that they might have accumulated yeah. as yeah. As yeah. High high up calling. They're coining jobs. it. Yeah. While claiming that we don't have a paid clergy, while teaching priestcraft, although interestingly I haven't heard a talk on that for years, because now we know that they're doing it, so they're a bit embarrassed. I think every revelation we get about the sins that the apostles are committing suddenly there's a topic that disappears from general conference talks they're not gonna have many left soon i haven't heard one about lying for a very long time because they've been caught lying so often it's fascinating how they suddenly stop talking about the thing they got caught doing nothing That's about right. the occult for years since we found out joseph smith was up to his eyeballs in it um so absolutely one one of the most interesting things i found doing some research for for my podcast was that until the early 20th century, uh, state presidents and bishops used to get a, a salary because it is a full time job. Um, they now, would Joseph get, Smith Senior. It was that Joseph Smith yeah. Senior made money giving out um, blessings, right? Yeah, your patriarchs got paid. Patriarchal um, they blessings. Gave you a patriarchal blessing. Mm -hmm. um, the bishops would get 10% of the tithing that their ward paid. State presidents got, I think, ten percent of the tithing their stake paid, um, and in a I way, that's Dean Michael Quinn to local income. Um, provided those yeah. figures for us. I think Dean Michael Quinn yeah. did in yeah. one of his books. And then the general authorities decided, oh well, no, that needs to stop. But we'll keep paying ourselves and keep giving ourselves pay rises. I mean, it's just classic institutional corruption where you justify it to yourself over time until you normalize an aristocracy who are getting very rich yep. while everyone corruption. else is sacrificing the you know our bishops and really society presidents and state presidents they don't get reimbursed for the incredible amounts they pay on fuel and petrol driving to meetings traveling around the stake they you know a lot of them are matching their paid work hours with the time that they're putting in so absolutely and with that you you know the training actually getting proper training on how to right. lead um at least basic psychology and counseling skills training as and well as what the on, church is better at now and training on the resources available to. yeah but don't send them to jody hildebrand 
you know because there's been a lot of that there's been there's a whole industry once once the church did positively stop expecting bishops to solve everyone's marital problems and do all the counseling they said send them to um professionals and we'll use fast offering to do it well immediately it turns out in america this whole industry you know which must be worth tens of millions of dollars um jody hildebrand just alone has raked in that much money um of people being referred to as therapists who are seen as mormon kosher which usually means they're less qualified and less professionally ethical um, and more obedient maybe to some of the local leaders yeah yeah um they're making a fortune out of this i mean so they definitely need some guidance on who do you actually trust as someone to refer your flock to you know what are the professional criteria here um maybe we should have uh an authorized sort of system of some kind we kind of do here in britain my mum was one she no she she trained as a relationship counselor and um at the end of her career was work, working purely with lds clients referred to by family services and she was qualified she was you know they were functioning professionally um and keeping it based on their professional ethical training uh but clearly whatever's gone on in idaho and utah and the heartland has thrown away any kind of restraint or professionalism or whatever that people like jody could be meeting with general authorities getting blessings from a temple president and then popping home to torture someone else's children in the in the desert sun i mean it you know with without appropriate qualifications um while being paid a fortune by mormons Sure. So that is a huge issue. Absolutely professionalizing enough. I'm, I love a lay clergy, but at least have the decency to cover their costs, you know, rather than being right. called as a bishop, meaning. Yeah, it could be a modest thing. It's, it's not, something, income. not something yeah. somebody would aspire to as a career or anything like that, but something that will mm. at least make them mm. more at ease about committing so much time in the service of their yeah. fellow yeah. ward members. Yeah. And so their family you have anything... should not have to sacrifice more than anyone else. Yeah. What's the next item on our agenda here? Oh, I don't know. Oh, Let's please. say something else financial. Let's go with tithing. So end it. Stop it now. Stop it. We were promised. Joseph, you know, tithing used to be 10% of your annual increase which in the agricultural economy of the mid 1800s i think was regarded as an annual profit of about six percent on your assets so you're only paying ten percent of six percent it was microscopic what right. tithing actually meant originally then lorenzo snow whacked it up temporarily he promised to clear the church's debts and said and that had a caveat of who has capacity who is able to pay if you've got enough yeah, money if you to have to means it, if you have means have he then, who have means so every man woman and child poor, who has means if you're poor and yeah, struggling to put food on the pay. table you're not a yeah someone who's in the category of being a tithe payer payer and, they, and then they, the lying began yes the absolute shameless financially exploitative sinful lying began that they started to really appreciate much larger wax of money coming in. So in all the teaching manuals throughout the 20th century up till recently, when that quote from President Snow about paying 10% was used in manuals, they put ellipses in to remove the ha who has means caveat. They taught it as everyone must pay 10% of their income. They emphasize that this is not 10% of profits, it's 10% of gross. If you want gross blessings, you're paying 10% on your gross, not your net. And definitely, I remember not hearing um, an apostle come to our Oakland mm -hmm. uh, conference building and all the leaders in the area. And it's the first time I ever heard him. He said that very same thing. If you want net blessings, pay on the net. If you want gross blessings, pay on the gross. So it's like, the more you pay, the more blessings you will get, which kind yeah. of doesn't seem yeah. like a Jesus-y thing yeah. to say either. <laughs> yeah. One of the most embarrassing things I've had to face and admit myself, and mercifully it's not as bad as some people have had to grapple with, 
is I totally fell for the utter lunacy of the idea that paying 10% tithing is fair for everyone at every income level. Because on a shallow level, you think, well, it's proportional to your income. That's fine. We're all making the same kind of sacrifice. Sounds what equal. What nonsense. L losing 10% of your income when you're poor and you have no, no spare cash means your children go hungry. And these hypocritical, avaricious swines stand at pulpits in general conference teaching that tithing is for the destitute as much as anyone else and as that's right go go without it. food and pay your tithing and god will find a way or go to the bishop to get you, food you'll have pay your miracle. tithing first but at the same time those people justify to themselves receiving an income from the tithing in the top five or less percent of income levels in their country because they can't possibly ever risk that happening to them they couldn't possibly with be within a million miles of having to choose between their general authority children going without food or paying tithing and this is how the church fetishizes the suffering of the poor and they insist that the destitute save for a mission at least to some extent and they tell these stories of these poor people in other countries than white America who are spending years saving for a mission as if this is great when their own, they wouldn't allow that to happen to their own children at all. They would never put up with that kind of sacrifice being required of their family. They just wouldn't. And it's, it's this displacement. They both exploit the international poor of the developing world um, while patronizing them and and literally making spiritual fetishizing out of their suffering that they wouldn't dream of imposing an award in Utah. And, right. and this also manifests as not not giving welfare support. You know, there are very strict limitations in the developing world on what welfare funds can be used for. But if you're in a developed world, oh, we'll pay your rent, we'll pay your food bills, we'll pay the fuel, we'll make sure your life is comfortable um, and carries on kind of as normal. But these people, no, you, we've, you know, there was that charity that started for, for malnourished Latter-day Saint children in Guatemala. I mean, you just couldn't, discovering yeah, this and, just and totally you know, crashed the church's ethical credibility for me. The, the larger yeah. picture is, is still in the financial arena. They wouldn't have to hide mm -hmm. their finances if you ended tithing. There could be transparency. Yeah. So that would be a prediction yeah. that they're going to announce. Um, yeah. Bringing yeah. back the financial reports. And not only that, maybe have yes. a website that says where all the money is and how much is it and where it's invested. Like all the other churches, like, like all, all the, the other, other churches. responsible churches do. Yeah. And, and um, Joseph, just to finish on that point, Joseph F. Smith promised in general conference, sort of at the tail end of this, let's get ourselves out of debt thing, in 1909 or 1913 or something general conference he said when we have enough money in the storehouse that we can live off the interest we will not expect another penny from anyone not even tithing it's not like you have to do it for your spiritual goods like they're trying to sell it now that they've admitted they don't need a penny we passed that threshold a while ago with ensign peak we we the church now spends less than it gets in annually for tithing anyway and all of that is less than its annual profits from Enzyme Peak. So they haven't spent any of Enzyme Peak at all because they haven't needed to because the tithing money coming in each year covers it all and then some. But if they needed to rely on Enzyme Peak alone, they've got more than enough, more That's than right. enough by billions, just they, as interest each year. They wouldn't lose any of the core. They could couch it in, in this way. They could say every mm. member is part of the whole church. The whole church now has yeah. an, a mass, a massive storehouse. Yeah. The church will now yeah. dole that storehouse out to help poor and needy people all around. And, and it's all because yeah. of the members and thank everybody for doing it. Yeah. And yes. and it, yeah. it could be all well wrapped up in the we same thing. We don't need thing. another. Yeah. We don't need another penny from you. You've already paid. It worked. We invested wisely. What a blessing. It's a miracle. And, Hurrah. And if we and have here's excess, an allowance, your wards, yeah, your wards get to from spend our this investments, on goods in your community. If we have excess from our yeah. investments, we will use that 
to mm. succor the poor, just like Jesus wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing to bear in mind, which is hysterical, is they have given the purse strings of this vast amount of money. EPA is larger than the gross national product of all but 40 of the world's nation states. And they've given it to idiots because all the interviews they've had with the presiding bishopric over the last few years since its existence um, became known. These men are stupid. One of them was saying literally um, that the the purpose of hoarding all this money was to get us through another event like the Wall Street crash. Yeah, financial crisis. Well, the whole point, the whole point of the Wall Street crash was all the hoarded money in stocks and shares became worthless overnight. It and is in extreme a... danger. Moth and rust is going to corrupt. Thieves are going to take it. You need to spend it now before it disappears. So you at least do some good with it. There's an urgency there. Stop sitting on 100 billion. It could be gone tomorrow. All of it. All that, all that potential to do good wasted. And that would, that would be an unforgivable sin based on everything Jesus has taught. And my solution for this is very simple. They will need to announce at conference that we're gonna, we're just gonna choose bog standard any ward anywhere. We're gonna choose a CTR class of ten year old children. Um, leave them in a room for half an hour. Tell them they've got a budget of a hundred billion dollars. Um, they will know how to spend it like Jesus would want it spent. They will come up with that in half an hour because it's so freaking obvious. Children could work that out. They wouldn't need any adult intervention at all. I think we should just do that because Jesus said to the rich man, give it all up now and save yourself before it's too late. Um, do that. They will come up with a great list. None of it will be bad ideas. It would absolutely be channeling Jesus. Spend it like the 10 year olds told you to. Are there, you are there work any, that out overnight. Are there more things on our list still that we need to cover? Oh, absolutely. So um, that's tithing. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, missions. Bring back the membership report. And part of that would be, um, you know, actually being honest. Like, here's the number of people we yeah. don't know where they are. We normally take them off at 110. Yeah. yeah. But we're going to put that off yeah. to the side and we're going to say they're yeah. not in the membership. Active anymore. membership. And we're going to go. Yeah. Who are, all what the is other the churches. active membership? Right. Yeah. What's the active membership of the church, the real membership participating, which my, I think it's around 3 million and falling. I would say all the indicators points that I've been. So we, we in Britain have been saying this for a while and it looks like widow's might and everyone else doing the analysis is coming around to that and realizing that this is the case because it's otherwise, far lower than most people think the people in yeah. are thinking all is well in Zion, right? They don't yeah, think yeah. they see all the temples the going up and they think um, yeah. everything's okay. The leaders are doing a bang up job. Yeah. There's no re need to ruffle the feathers. Every, everything's going exactly the way God wants it. Mm. Yeah. And and yet yeah. there's turmoil no, all it's, around. It's a, yeah. And it's a disaster and there it's about to collapse. And you can see it locally. Everyone can see that. But they assume they're an anomaly and it's all going well somewhere else when it really isn't. Um, you know, they, we always looked in the 80s and 90s. It's all the church is booming in Latin America. We had no idea Elder Holland was there shutting down stakes left, right and centre. And their activity rate is probably more like 2%. Seriously, I mean, the madness. Yeah, just be honest with people. I think and we had a recent example of this, that two talks in the same conference a couple of years ago admitted that since the 1990s, um, the majority of adults active in the church have not been married. They've been single or divorced or, you know. Um, I mean, that's a staggering paradigm shift. If we had talked about that in the 90s, we'd never have wasted our breath on the stupid family proclamation and alienated all those single people. There would have been like serious re-evaluation of why do we keep harping on about marriage as the be-all and end-all, or what do we do about this, or how do so we you, help single people so, to Sounds like you're predicting a good, a good conference yeah. prediction would be to tear up the family proclamation once and for all, don't let Dallin yeah. Oaks have a shot at making it scripture anytime soon. 
Or if he does vote opposed, that's going to be really interesting. I'm fascinated by that because he hasn't he hasn't done it. He's the only person obsessed with it still. Hardly anyone talks about it. I think he knows he doesn't have the backup from the other apostles to canonize it, or they'd have done it long ago. Nelson would have done it long ago, but he hasn't. Um, and I'd, I think I'm I'm wondering if the tide is turning. I, I'm wondering because the fact that we now have these little glimmers that um, they there's a very open and public and well known same sex married Mormon and his partner are receiving sacrament have callings in their ward. They've appointed an LGBTQ ally as president newsroom, although he's still in hiding months later, um, Aaron Sherinian. And they are authorizing the baptism of transgender people who have transitioned. Um, and if they had moved think, faster, despite... maybe, maybe David Archuleta <laughs> would still be a member and still be singing. <laughs> exactly. You know, then, I know. Conferences. Um, I mean, obviously, with the on the other hand, there's the fight back with making the musket fire speech compulsory reading at BYU, which is insane. But I think what just said, you know, if this was the Kremlin back in the old days of the Soviet Union, what would be reading into this? We would say power struggle. This screams power struggle. This means the Politburo is divided. And all these things coming out of that clearly indicate people with factions of power. They absolutely hate each other. They totally disagree. And the power of these very, very old and di literally dying first presidency of fundamentalists is waning fast. And the other guys know that they're going to die soon and they're going to inherit an absolute mess from these people and their rhetoric. The um, foundations especially of the, Dallin Oaks trying... Yeah. The foundations of the patriarchy are um are yeah, cracking. Crumbling. So They're that's cracking that's what seems to be dressing. happening. Yeah. So so you know it's time for change. There will be revolution. I'm intrigued what's gonna it could even start happening sooner than we think. I they they've had they've read the root there is ultimately in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is elite a survival instinct. When they knew they just couldn't carry on with institutional racist segregation anymore, they ended it after doubling down on it against social norms for decades. When they en when they just couldn't carry on with polygamy, they ended it after doubling down on it against social norms for decades. They will do the same about ordaining women. They will do the same about LGBTQ inclusion. Um, it's going to happen, but... And often it's the people you least expect who see that they will lose their salary and their power if they don't make the change now. Right. If so they had any sense, it's a survival they really instinct. Go. Yes, I, that has got to kick in at some point. And if it doesn't kick in from the leadership, my thesis is that it will be enough of local leaders looking at the fact that their children have left and their ward is about to close who will get desperate enough to take desperate measures. And I'm saying to them, you can vote opposed, replace these leaders. You've they've already cost us too many members. They're not worth it. They're all replaceable. They're the same as us. Remember how we used to be taught in the eighties? Not that they're preordained god men who who must be in power and you can't question them like they keep teaching now. No, they're one of us. Who God calls, He empowers. It could, there's no difference between the, the usher at the door and the president of the church. We used to be taught. We're all in this together. They are replaceable. And that one idea, if it could only sink in and, and local people give themselves permission, just vote opposed. It won't break the church. We already have so you, a constitution that can replace them. You know, you know what I say to people and, is that yeah. Putin won 87 percent of the vote. At the last election, I believe, and what is, yeah. and we, and everybody would say, "Oh, that just shows how horrible their their democracy is, right? It's not a very good democracy yeah. if that yeah. many people are They're running." Then I would say, "Well, how many people voted for President Nelson at the last conference? What percent was that?" Yeah, yeah. What does that <laughs> tell you about the healthiness of this organization? Yeah. So missions. <laughs> um, yes. I think there was a, I just saw this morning the April Fool thing going viral about missionaries can have pets. <laughs> I totally fell for it at first because all crazy stuff always happens in our religion. Turned out to be an April Fool. But um, 
I think there's um, our whole mission system is utterly broken. I've been ward mission leader in three different wards, and it's been a mess all the way throughout for decades. I've served a mission. It's just a disaster. It's not even. It's one purpose. Eventually, um, they stopped trying to convert families. They stopped trying to convert the middle classes. They're just making do with usually single people who are lost and transients. Is the majority of of people who get baptized in most parts of the world now. Um, but at least the bottom line was, well, the mission is to convert the missionary, but that isn't even working. You know, the, the, a huge percentage of return missionaries are leaving early from their missions and they're leaving the church rapido. Nearly all of our recent missionaries in my ward have, were gone as fast as they could. That's a disaster. So Some the of that whole could thing be attributed to the lack of reform. transparency with history and other things over the last, um, yeah, hundred years. Absolutely. Yeah. Although interestingly, some of the recent missionaries who've come through the new curriculum with the with the more accurate history are handling it much better. They're aware, they know about the stuff. They're not bothered about it because they got inoculated, like um, Ballard recommended. You know, it's working. I don't know how they teach and sell this to other people, but it is a sign that if you're just honest about history, even if it's messy, that's fine. We all know human beings are a mess. That's okay. It doesn't become an existential crisis. It's lying about the history and selling a rose-tinted version that isn't true that sets people up for disillusionment. So just so be honest you, with the history. We don't need to hide it. Plus, how yeah. about this? Missionaries are trained to teach, but they go out and serve more. And they yeah. set examples. I think they, yeah. they become a light yeah. on, on, the, on the hill. Yeah. And allow them to serve consistently in a role, like to do longer things. The The interesting thing is that while the church is giving much more kind of equal status and kudos to service missions, I thought they would be increasing. But when I had to look, they do publish these stats. The number of service missionaries has plummeted over the last few years. It's, actually, it's almost halved. It's fallen through the floor. It's got dropped a lot anyway. Um, so they're not even, you know, managing to recruit people for that, even though it seems like they're getting a higher profile in, in the church's propaganda and everything at the moment. I mean, it's all falling through the floor. So the, the um, church has made think, lots of strides I, in, in making yeah. missions more palatable. They can call every week. Yeah. They don't have to wear the rigid yeah. dress code. What else has been improving? Mm. Um, um, I think... Yeah, not much, to be honest. I don't think much else has improved because they don't have any new ideas. Um, Elder Ballard tried to say, obviously, we shouldn't be try committing people to baptism on their first and second discussion. But that totally blew up in his face because he wrote Preach My Gospel and it told them to do that. That was one of the biggest lies an apostle has ever told. It was astonishingly, I don't know what yeah, one that of, one of the about quickest how his lies brain to works. fact check. I so you know well we you know to say that to a membership where we all went on missions and we all know perfectly well that apostles were telling us to commit people to baptism on the first discussion it was seen as a filter to sort the righteous from the the direct literally so, taught like that and he said oh people seem to think it's a filter so I so think the way to go five is, recommendations and, to make missions yeah. better or a yeah. couple handful do not baptize yeah don't baptize anyone within six months of meeting them. Other churches make you beg for baptism. You have to prove yourself for well over a year in a lot of the local churches around here. And then they have retention. Um, you know, we've just had a lovely guy baptized, just adorable, but he's already gone because his family were totally hostile to it and he was never going to be able to stay in his situation at home, which no one had checked out or been realistic about. So that was a waste. Um but you need all those teeth you need a social conversion. You need the three things President Hinckley talked about, a calling, a purpose, you know, knowledge, um, social integration, a friend, um, all of that stuff. They need to understand fully what becoming a Latter-day Saint involves and what's expected. And they can adjust their life to it before taking on board these commitments or particularly burdening the ward with yet another less active person to worry about and feel overwhelmed by, which is destructive and demoralizing. That doesn't help the ones who are there. Um, so there's that. 
I think we should have, why not, a different Preach My Gospels. We have the money in the church to hire the best educational, marketing, scholarly experts in any field needed to write amazing Preach My Gospels. We need to preach my gospel as in a system of teaching for people who are Buddhist. We need one for Catholics. We need one for Hindus. We need one in my community for Sikhs. We need one for Protestants. We need, we can adapt, find our common grounds, which is what it's all about, use their language, educate the missionaries in what their language and understanding is, and bring out that one. And particularly, we need to be proud of our unique doctrines and its depth and complexity. Forget the dumbing down, keep it basic stuff, because it's become uninteresting and we've lost our unique selling points. We should have Preach My Gospel for university graduates, for people with an education who believe in evolution. We need to speak to them because there's a lot of very science friendly stuff in our teachings, in our big, big idea, in the, the teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, who are all about bringing all knowledge from any source into our religion, including science, geology, the glory chemistry. Of God is intelligent. Yes, and we should run with that because at the moment we our church is made in how it functions for middle class nuclear families with middle class jobs with their weekends free who who do a nine to five during the week work. Um, if all we're baptizing is people who are working class who have difficult transient lives who are unemployed or who do difficult working class job shifts at factories that mean they can't come to church regularly on a Sunday. You don't have your people who can function in stable ways as the, the foundation for everyone else. Absolutely, Christianity should be a religion for every social class and person and the poor. But Big you tent. can't run it that way. It has to be. You have to have, you know, the way it works is educated, stable, nuclear families with an, a university level of education, um, able to teach the stuff, understand the stuff, have the management skills and experience, whatever. Um, but we're not baptizing those people. We used to raise them. We used to, you know, the, the formula was you convert a working class family and you raise the aspirations of their children and they go to university. But now we're losing more than 80% of our kids by their 20s. We need to convert them. We need to be appealing and it's just not happening. But you yeah, could needs do to it be... if you weren't teaching them shallow dreck as your discussions from the, the teenage missionaries. There needs you to know, be solid... train up members to teach it. Yeah. Solid life skills could be taught. Like yeah. mindfulness yeah. and meditation are equal to yeah. prayer for people who want to, mm. you know, have calm in their lives, right? Yeah. And that um use that know, there's... language. Yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with learning more and, you know, and and go with it. You know, there's there. Yeah. And we should teach yeah. principles that people mm -hmm. can use in, in their everyday lives as teenagers, as young adults, mm -hmm. as, you know, middle aged, mm -hmm. you know, as seniors. There are there are things that exist. I mean, right now, most people just go to like YouTube or, you know, to you know, do it yourself or find out other what other people say to them, you know. But the mm. church could be mm. uh, an educational hub for yes. growth, and it for used the whole to world. be at least in theory. Yes, it, at least in theory. I mean, we are. I I'm militant about our religion being potentially the most relevant manifestation of Christianity for the space age and the information age. We've already encompassed the scale of the universe in our doctrine of multiple gods and our potential to be out there in the stars. I mean, it's totally Star Trek. Brilliant. Um, we are highly dem democratic if we practice common consent. And having power diffused to grassroots level is the, the big development in global society and free countries of the last century, a complete change from being ruled by powerful elites. But our church is still leadership, want to be the aristocracy. They're still running it that way. And their friends and relatives get all the top jobs and the money. Um, you just can't do that in this day and age. So absolutely, we need to work to our doctrinal strengths, 
the idea that we're on a, a learning journey means absolutely we can be honest about all the mistakes we've made in the past without breaking the religion. As long as you stop pretending they didn't happen, as you stop, as long as you stop claiming your leaders are infallible. And I think this is where um, one of my other major suggestions, which I mention a lot in the podcast, comes in, is there are, if you put put it all together, they, there are kind of six filters that every member of the church and every convert or, or investigator can be taught to apply before they feel any ob obligation to believe something is true. And if things get through these six filters, you can really, you know, you're a long way to being able to trust them. And that creates a solid foundation for your belief system and it filters out the dreck. Um, so is it compatible with the scriptures? You know, whatever this doctrine or teaching is. Does it make rational sense, you know, that we must have a rational faith? You can't not have a rational faith in the, in the information age. Um, is, does it make him, is it emotionally intelligent? Is it clear that these beliefs and ideas and policies are coming from a place of love and compassion? Um, is it, does it have apostolic approval? Is there unity among the church leaders that this should be a true principle? So you have then the apostolic authority, the but the separation. You know, do all the seventy agree? Do do the first presidency and twelve apostles agree with this? Has it? And then with that number five, has it been presented to the whole membership for a common consent vote? Does it have the collective? And that certainly you're introducing the women at that point. Um, you know, once you ordain women, they'll be in the other quorums as well. But that's where you get the the wisdom of the women kicking in. Um, right. You know, has is it something that has passed the test of a common consent vote? And finally, do you, and, and it doesn't have to be in this order. Number six is: Have you received a spiritual witness from God that it's true? Any of those six filters on their own has weaknesses your emotions can be manipulated you're not always being rational the leaders could be wrong the scriptures need interpreting they can be interpreted lots of ways sometimes the majority of the people are wrong it's rare our scriptures tell us and they deserve what's coming to them when the majority lose it but usually they're right um and emotions can be manipulated if I haven't said that already and and we but can when Peter, you have we can... to have something past all six that's pretty tough. That's a and strong for, filter. For things like your sixth one that says, you know, spiritual witness, mm -hmm. we can equate that with your own inner voice. What does your own inner voice yeah. say? Yeah. Trust yourself. Yeah. Take in information. Be mindful of yeah. all the, the different uh, ramifications of mm -hmm. choices, of, of what, you know, you're learning, of what societal problems are. And... and you know, trust that you, your feeling is something that is, is worthy, yeah. right? And if you, if you need to still rely on God, you, there's, that's acceptable too, but allow all of it to be like, yeah. we'll have different definitions yeah. for different people for the educated. Yeah. If, if it's because got, you trust what you, your training and you trust, you know, your mind skills that you've developed then that's what you should go for when, when you're acting on, on things. If, if you are if you are the same species as God, if you are a God in training, of course that's how it should be. And the fact that they the leadership of the church are now working so hard to suppress nearly all of those things just shows how off course they are, that they don't know their own religion and they, they have become the Lucifer Pharisees who are all about con command and control and appearances and measurable ways to tick off whether you're righteous or not. Um, and it's so sad because this, you know, we, we both in our age group experience the church in that gap between getting rid of racism and justifying it to this new doubling down on the authority and the infallibility of the leaders retrenchment we had this really yes we had this really interesting period in which the church boomed and grew um or, or seemed to at least it was doing better than it is now um where that was our ethos we were fearless it was before the internet told us how much we were being lied about but so we were we were overconfident with our history but certainly these core values leaders are accountable to the members voting is not about us declaring undying loyalty to them which is what they teach now 
but it was the other way around. Everyone is accountable to the people. That was taught repeatedly in my childhood. That was how everyone understood that to, that accountability of, of voting opposed if you need to, to mean, and a common consent. Um, all of these have been taught individually. There have been talks recently where the apostles yeah. have said that there should be a consensus among the leaders. Don't believe stuff that only one or two leaders are saying. It needs to be something that's taught often and repeatedly. Great wisdom. We've been taught that things should be compatible with scripture, but they're now undermining that with Haney and others saying that scriptures don't age well. Um, we've been taught we should right. have a rational faith, that you you think it through in your own mind, then go to God. Um, you know, we've all of these six filters are there, but they won't put them together. You won't hear them put them in a list together because they know it would be damning to them. And I'd like so to... much of what they've tried to bamboozle people to believe. Remind my viewers that um, Peter has hundreds of hours ex explaining all these things that are on his channel, yeah. Mormon Civil War. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're happy to have Peter. We we'll go for a few more minutes. Are there some things on the list that sure. we haven't covered yet? We'll go through a few yeah, more of those. Yeah, we've done really well. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Quick fire. So youth interviews, obviously remove any sexual content from, from those interviews or handle that get, extremely differently. Get the and church, the leaders in counseling. Get the church out of the bedroom and people's private lives. <laughs> yeah. And, and even the whole concept of this worthiness, that your worthiness has to keep being checked. How, oh, how is it that so many other ch churches function without that? I mean, the Catholics do it, obviously, and they're quite big. But most of, most of the rest of the Christian world does not interrogate their children technically at least twice a year, maybe more, probably a lot more we do, about their worthiness. I mean, it's disgusting if you just think about it. It's children being unworthy. You're, you're worthy um, already as a, as a child of God. Yeah, yeah, you're worthy enough. Um I think the idea of global representation, um, we, we've got this yeah. idea that, that's taught in seminary and institute that the 12 apostles will judge the 12 tribes of Israel, that somehow they are allocated to nationalities in that sense. Um, and that that's part of whatever is going to go on at the end times and judgment. Well, so let's let's apply that principle now why not have each apostle called from a different region of the church right and, oh, and if we and... if we genuine if if we believe that anyone can be an apostle if they're they're worthy and and god calls them that's what empowers them there are hundreds of people who could totally do that job in every region of the church hundreds of them they're not and, and... You to know, go it's along not with just that, your best friend and your relatives. Yeah. Uh, an even more radical thing would be maybe to have 12 separate ch churches that could each exist in their own region that would have, that would be m way more similar to each other in, in their governing and their problems that they have mm -hmm. in, the, in helping each other. And, and there could be still like headquarters maybe in Salt Lake or somewhere mm -hmm but have, let some autonomy go on. What are the regional problems and issues that they're dealing with? And let, let's call, yeah. let's grow de and develop leadership from all these, all these areas. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at the moment, Britain, which is, you know, one of the, the, got the longest countries with some of the longest history in the church, we've got, we've just got one apostle again after decades of that one. And we've only got one other member of the 70. We are massively underrepresented. You know, it's it's not just, you know, brown people not being represented. It's far it's totally dominated by white Utah. Americans from the Morridor. Yeah. Um, so I to I think there's a risk with having that much autonomy, but certainly that concept of representation and bringing and being able to adapt local practices to local needs, which is Maybe that there could be in a theory already goal. in the handbook. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but definitely having that regional representation at the top tables is essential. Yes. And would change a lot of things and, and just give them a reality check. Almost everyone who kind of works around the the apostles 
agrees that they are out of touch, that they don't really realise how bad it is down on the grounds or, or what it's actually like in a lot of the wards. They're fed a real rose-tinted version of things. Everyone who does research for the church has reported that who talk about it has said they get leaned on to massage their figures and how they interpret them and how they present them. So the leadership are not getting an honest sense of things. Everyone's lying to them because they get punished if they don't. It's, you know, it's totally dysfunctional. Um, but I think also that that idea of diversity has to happen in every ward. I think something you said before, which is really powerful, is the idea of being as welcome in your ward if you're not a literal believer, if you just appreciate the scriptures like the Book of Mormon as metaphor, as having good story and message. I think absolutely don't expect people to be, I know this is the truth and God told me to in a spiritual manifestation. And Make you have to go through or around everyone. the Book of Mormon in order to... Yeah, the Book of Mormon, be, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. To be a member. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of us are going through it and finding it's a bit flimsy. Um, so I think how we have to create that intellectual space for people to have their own version. You know, there are many ways to Mormon. We actually do this in reality when you get Mormons talking to each other. They all have slightly different beliefs about things. Um, but stop with this idea that only the most ignorant and therefore able to declare certainties without foundation fundamentalists are the real Mormons. That has to go because soon they'll be the only people left and they will continue to alienate everyone else. So no one will want to join their church and it will die when they die. That's what's literally happening now across the church. Right. Um, and that's, and that's why we're making crazy conference predictions so that we can this has got to happen <laughs> peter and i are are crafting you know what uh <laughs> utopic utopic uh mormon church might look like someday yeah. any, any and last the, and uh, the key is to empowering people i just think no i think we did really well we got through oh, what about like temples our, our list what yeah, about temples? so i just here in britain we've just been given birmingham temple which is between the Preston and London ones. It's our third British temple. It's in the wrong place because it's not where the people have to travel the furthest can get to. Um, it's going to kill the church faster because there is not a critical mass of membership to actually support it. It's planning application, which has just gone in, and Nemo and I did a program about this, admits that it's hardly ever going to be used in full um, they're already admitting defeat, which is not what they've been saying to the members. But you know, Peter, they're saying to the local if, our, if our suggestions yeah. of not having to pay tithing and not and yeah. getting the church out of the bedroom, <laughs> there would be a lot more temple recommend holders. This is true. So temple Absolutely. attendance could go um, up. Yeah. But the, the reality is the area where they're building this temple just closed a stake because of ca ca falling membership in order. And the philosophy taught around that is the idea that to, to let people just have one calling rather than three, including a state one and two ward ones, to free them up to be human, to to do missionary work, to meet other people. But now they've plonked a temple there. All of those people are going to be guilt tripped into doing lots and lots of temple work and being ordinance workers. And we just gave you a temple. Why are you not using it? So they will turn away from the living and be sucked into this mausoleum to service the dead. And it will kill the church faster because they won't be doing missionary work. They won't be working with the youth. They won't be saving their congregations. They will spend far too much time in the temple and their wards will die. So opening a temple up in in fragile LDS regions like that is like opening a black hole that will suck in all of the energy and light that's left. It will kill yeah. it faster. So maybe there madness. are maybe so there are too to many temples announced right now. Maybe there should be a reduction. There should be a recall yeah. of where all yeah. these temples are going, and 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 figure They're it out just, again. I mean, and maybe temple. They're announcing them be, for European countries. Yeah, maybe temple growth should be a matter of common consent as well. Yeah, absolutely. But also, I think just so prioritize the living over the dead. We're in an existential extinction event now. 
It's not theoretical. It's already happening. It started a while ago. We're just approaching the tipping point where it's unsalvageable and may have already passed it. This is not the time to be worrying about the dead people. You need to be piling every penny you've got in EPA, every ounce of time and energy that you have into hanging on to the members that you've got and being attractive for new members I, to join. I who think are going I to recall be long leaders. just as a, as a little kid thinking, well, if God was powerful, mm. you know, I mean, not a little kid because I didn't know the temple, you know, stuff that much. But at some point, maybe my late 20s, mm. maybe one yeah. person could be baptized for all the rest of the dead. And then one person could be have the endowment taken for all the rest of the dead that hadn't had their endowment. And another person could get married. Think. Two people get married for all the other people that hadn't been married. Go find your eternal companion in heaven. You're, the, the work is yeah. done for you. And now get to the living again, right? And so yeah. the temples could I mean, still it, be houses be of so instruction. Easy to do. Yeah. There could yeah. still be some School spiritual of words. Yeah. But yeah. maybe not get your own endowment still. Not yeah. yeah, personal commitments to be good to to yourself and your family, yeah. and you know, and and it could be but the expansive lead and inclusive. Yeah, the leadership have overplayed their hand, though they've made so many changes to the temple ordinances and endowment, which by definition are meant to be eternal and unchanging. Joseph Smith taught so that everyone in every age gets saved on the basis of exactly the same covenants made in the same way. As soon but as Peter, you change that, you open huge questions about, well, why is my endowment different to my children's one? Do I need to redo mine? Are they, what's, what covenants am I keeping now? No one explains. Our, our so at least explain their changes. Our conference yeah. <laughs> predictions are going to allow for a, a major overhaul, a radical change, you know, people voting on things, scripture committees, you know, committees that'll, you know, do the right things. It'll make things more inclusive. And so, you know, that's what the purpose of this conference prediction show is to say. That's what I'm looking forward were, to next weekend. Doesn't have to, <laughs> doesn't have to be all. 100 suggestions we'll take 30 you're right we'll, 80. baby steps i'm not compromising right? but at the same time you know too late um, 80 it when somebody's almost dead right and their heart stopped do we do we lose hope or do we still bring out one last machine to try to shock them back to life right so that's what the crazy that's conference are, prediction Gene show is what do you call that machine they say clear and then the defibrillator they, this is the defibrillator we are the, we are prediction show for for the lds church we can we gotta, save you but you need to hurry up get that heartbeat going again right we need to find we, where's the pulse Absolutely. right we need to find the pulse we need yeah. to get something going and so thanks so much peter for joining me on this show oh a pleasure um, i think this is uh, a great not, idea i'm really we are not doing this it. on april 1st this is april 2nd so it's clear <laughs> of any We're serious um, april <laughs> fool's jokes but it's it's a light-hearted but serious look at things that really could change changes that would affect better changes right things that would help you know the church be better now, some people think the only way is to, you know, lashes and um, what was it? Hellfire and damnation. What's the scripture where is it? Captain Moroni or somebody that says, I, I'd rather or Alma the younger. I'd rather um, teach people the correct principles. But it looks like we're, we're I'm stuck with just telling them the basics again. You know, but it's like there's higher laws yeah. out there yeah. that, you know, you can get. Yeah. And, and maybe the higher laws are are in us. Maybe we maybe what's been keeping us back yeah. is the lower laws. And so mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do It's like we're getting creative. We're trying to think of what possibly could happen. I told my son like 10 years ago, missionaries need to be less culty. If there's if you say the yeah. church isn't a cult, yeah. missions are cults. Right. 
Oh, every time. Such they meet all the criteria for, for a dangerous mind control strict cult. Strict rules. All the criteria. Read only yeah. what we yeah. give you. Don't have any outside sleep influence. Deprivation. Don't, yeah, don't yeah. sleep deprivation. Don't call your home. Don't contact your family. Mm -hmm. If somebody dies in your family, mm -hmm. we'll we'll pray for them. You stay on your mission, right? Yeah. So that'd be yeah. a good thing is to allow people to go home mm -hmm. and honorably, you know, be able to participate in their family while being a missionary, you know, and, and not be so strict at, at all those things. Yeah. Let people yeah. live. Give some think, breathing room. Where the church has the most control over people is at BYU and missions. And both of those be are becoming a dystopian nightmare. They're now making the employees at BYU give up their clergy client co uh, penitent confidentiality. They are agreeing for their bishops to dob them into the authorities if they express anything like empathy for LGBTQ people or people regard or causes regarded as hostile to the church. Um, they're waiving their, their basic human rights. Uh, and, is is and, this related to you know, the, the control? Do you discuss this in one of your recent um, podcasts? Um, I'm, I've mentioned it a few times. This is literally the change they made to contracts to all BYU employees. But this, but you know what? What as you're saying, if if you want the church not to look like a cult, why is its public facing interface, the missionaries, so culty and obviously right. visibly so? But then that's the same with our universities. If you give this church control and free reign, look what happens. It doesn't become an intellectual friendly place of compassion and tolerance and Christ-like love. It becomes a con a mental concentration camp. It becomes an indoctrination machine. It takes away your freedom. It makes everyone scared. It rules through fear and intimidation and control of your clothing and and everything else. And They're it, almost like and it starts to pander camps. to extremists. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and and that's how they openly describe them now. That they yeah. and President Holland, you know, in, in that speech and others reading you know, outrage letters from disgusted of Aurum saying, why why are my children being taught evolution and, and liberal values at your university, you know, when you're meant to be indoctrinating them to think like That's me. That's right. The um, exact opposite of what a university is supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. anyway. They they can't be trusted oh, with power. We yeah. might, I better go. So democracy. Do some, do some chores. <laughs> um, I got to get ready. I'm headed to um, Thailand. Um, thanks Peter for uh, coming on my show. Thank you for letting me go on your show. We'll try to get this out to both of our audiences <laughs> and, um, yep. you know, wish everybody a, a great spring. Um, see if any of our predictions come true in conference. We'll see. We'll, we could cross our fingers. Crosses are allowed nowadays, right? Cro crosses <laughs> are, we, we're not crossing ourselves yet, but that might be in a few that years. Will come. You never know. We're already Thanks. doing Holy Week. Anything's That's possible. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do some Hail Marys now. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. You know, if you like, if you like our shows, if you value, you know, what it, we're doing, tip um, Mormon Civil War, tip Latter Daily Digest, and um, We'll just say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for viewing. Bye bye, Peter. Thank you. Bye. Give bye. him the money. I'm I'm not monetized. Give it to him. <laughs> there you go.